to this computer. No, I'm not recording right now. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Welcome to the virtual public meeting uh, for SEMPO. This is the Metropolitan Transportation um, Plan Update. Uh, we refer to it as the MTP. Um, and with that, we'll get started and I will introduce our team to you all. My name is Kelly Green. Um, I'm the president here at KLG Engineering and uh, we are managing this project for SEMPO. Uh, my name is Cheryl Sharp. I'm the deputy project manager for this project. I'm with Lockmiller Group. And um, along with me today from Lockmiller Group, I also have Katie Shackelford. Hi, and thanks for having me. And Katie is really going to be more behind the scenes um, and making sure this runs well. Um, we also from Lockmiller have Sharif Ula, who um, is will be here for any questions that you may have, um, technical questions regarding the travel, demo, travel demand model, which we'll get into later. And I'm Marla Mills. I'm with KLG Engineering. And I'm Alex McElroy. I'm the Southeast Metropolitan Planning Organization Executive Director. And no, that is not my favorite outfit. That picture was taken today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Um, we're going to provide a brief 20 minute presentation to you all um, regarding the, the update that we've completed. Uh, there will be a period for question and answers as well. Um, the purpose of today's meeting is to share the draft plan with you all and to gather any feedback uh, that you may have. Just a couple housekeeping items. Um, please submit your questions in the Q&A box below. And also this meeting will be recorded and will be posted online for later viewing um, on the SIMPO's website listed below. And with that, we'll have Alex get started. Alex, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So what is the Southeast Metropolitan Planning Organization, or SEMPO, as you may have heard it? Um, don't feel bad if you have no idea what that is, or if this is the first time you've heard of it. Um, you're not alone. Uh, to understand what SEMPO is, uh, it's important to know what an MPO is. So an MPO, a Metropolitan Planning Organization, these are organizations that are formed um, when the U.S. Census Bureau comes in and identifies your area as having a population density of 50,000 or more. Once your area has reached that threshold, your area is designated as what they call an urbanized area. And with that designation comes certain federal requirements. The first federal requirement is that you establish an MPO. So for our community back in 2010, the census recognized Cape Girardeau and Jackson as having a, a population over 50,000. We established the Southeast Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is really just an organization that focuses on transportation policy initiatives. And on our next slide, I'll be able to give you a, a visual of what our boundaries look like. So our actual urbanized area are the colored areas you can see there with Cape Girardeau, Jackson, you probably aren't covering up. We, we do cross the river there a little bit in East Cape Girardeau, and then we go down into Scott City a little bit with our airport, and we also incorporate our port along the river. So you can see there a geographic area of City of Cape, Jackson, um, portions of Cape Girardeau County, and this is a little difficult to see on the map, but our actual, it's called an MPA, our Metropolitan Planning Area, is outlined with that green outline. So we go into portions of white when you leave Cape Jackson proper. You can see around um, just south of Fruitland, you can see that green line. It goes just past our urbanized area. 
So we consider even portions of the county with our planning initiatives. Okay, so now then, now that we understand what an MPO is, um, let's understand what the MTP is, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. This is a multimodal transportation plan that guides um, regional investments in transportation over the next 20 years. Uh, you can see the document to your right. Um, that's the original MTP that was developed in 2016. Um, so every five years, this plan has to be updated. Um, this is a federally mandated document. What's included in the MTP? Uh, we include existing conditions. We do an analysis of all the existing uh, infrastructure that, that's available. Um, we look at all different modes of transportation, not just roadways. Um, we, we discuss and work with the public and talk about goals and objectives. Uh, we, we look at different um, project recommendations that come from our member agencies. Uh, we look at project costs then and then um, associated potential funding sources available. So to get started, uh, what did our team look at when we were looking at updating this, this particular MTP? Uh, fortunately, uh, within the SIMPO region, um, or the MPA, many of the member agencies already have a lot of plans um, developed. Um, and so we looked at a lot of those different planning documents. Um, we again talked to a lot of folks uh, with all the different member agencies um, and we, we combined all of that information and um, considered all of that as we moved forward with the MTP update. So who did we talk to? Um, we held nine virtual focus group meetings. Um, if you all were in those, you know that Ms. Marla um, led most of those, um, or all of those. Uh, we were so pleased that we had 58 participants um, within those focus groups, and you can see them listed on the screen, the different groups that we had. Um, we also formed um, an online public survey, and we were really pleased that we had 143 um, responses from that survey. So it's very important that, that we're gathering information, not just from um, you know, the analysis and the engineers and not just from the member agencies, but from everybody that, that transportation affects. And so we were really pleased with this, this response. So taking those responses uh, that we heard from the public, we turned that into a vision statement and we looked at goals and objectives, like where does the region want to go in the next 20 years? What does it want to, what does your future uh, system and network look like? And so we came up with a vision, goals, objectives, um, strategies, and some performance measures. And so getting into the vision statement here, we have, uh, um, the decide of, uh, vision statement was the Sempo Metropolitan Planning Area is a growing and thriving center for business, education, healthcare, and culture, which is supported by a safe, efficient, dependable, equitable, and innovative multimodal transportation network that facilitates an integrated approach to land use and development. Now there's a lot packed into that statement, but um, there's a lot of things that you're trying to do here um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the region. So, um, so breaking that down into um, um, the goals and objectives then. So how do we achieve this vision? Uh, the first one, first goal has to do with safety. We're really ensuring that the safety and security of all travelers, regardless of mode. And so the objectives in trying to achieve this goal uh, is identifying, you know, to, to achieve this goal, we want to reduce the number of crashes, reduce the severity of crashes, reduce the number of modal conflicts. And what that means is, uh, for instance, um, looking at you know reducing the number of car versus bicyclist uh, conflicts or or other um, or other modes of transportation there, and also supporting community resiliency. So another goal that we have. Um, 
would be system management. And the goal here would be to facilitate efficient management of the system uh, with emphasis on preserving the existing system and ensuring reliability. Now, if several of these objectives that we see here is really focusing on maintaining the system, um, not necessarily for expansion. You know, we want to make sure that you can um, you know, maintain and pay for maintenance um, of exactly what you have, that you're not overbuilding, um, you know, and increasing then sprawl after that. And, um, you know, at the same time, increasing those modal options um, um, down, at the, down below. So another goal is accessibility, uh, providing transportation options that are accessible to all users. And, you know, so this is, you know, your network should be available for all ages and abilities um, and for various modes of transportation. So we want to improve access for to transportation for disabled persons, uh, for low income persons. Um, and we want to make sure that our transit systems, for instance, uh, are compatible uh, with bicycle and pedestrian systems. You know, this, this is a network, this is a system um, that is serving all of everyone. It's not just about roads. Um, so keeping transit affordable and um, maintaining and enforcing non-discrimination policies um, also help achieve that goal. So with economic enhancement, the goal here uh, is support economic resiliency and prosperity with transportation solutions. And so really this is focusing more on the movement of goods. So, uh, well, in people, but it's, it's not just moving people on roads. Um, we do have to think about freight moving through the network um, um, and everything there. And also supporting tourism through transportation related activities. And next one, uh, environmental stewardship and social equity. Uh, the goal here would be to conduct transportation related activities in a manner that supports responsible management of the environment and ensures the fair treatment of all people. And so we have some uh, objectives below that also help um, that would that we, we would be tracking for uh, this goal. So such as improving air quality and improving water quality. And finally, one that um, the previous five goals that I just mentioned really track with the federal goals um, uh, and also state goals um, in helping decrease, uh, you know, decrease crashes and, you know, improving safety and maintaining your, uh, your system. So another one that we heard from the public um, that is not necessarily uh, a nationally uh, uh, national goal would be the coordination and engagement. So this is really something we heard from the focus groups. And the goal here would be to promote the coordination of transportation related activities and the effective man engagement of stakeholders. And um, there was really a, the focus group participants really wanted to um, really look at that coordination amongst all of the member agencies uh, in supporting support that sharing of information. Um, and you know, looking to see how there might be a, a better way to provide uh, more direct ways of communicating with the public about transportation. Um, so, um, so in achieving these goals and objectives, you know, there's also the analysis of the network um, that goes into this plan. So we first started by documenting past performance. This is uh, the the federal government does require that this is a data-driven process and you know and it's based on performance-based metrics and so we documented the past performance looking back such as crash history which i'll get into in a second here um, but it's also analyzing that long-term future we projected out to 2045 to see what those uh, improvements may need uh, in the next 20 years and we looked at a couple different scenarios as well, you know, like, you know, no, no one can, um, you know, accurately predict, you know, like this is exactly what's going to happen. So that's why we look at a couple different scenarios of, of growth to, you know, make sure that what we are recommending would uh, cover a, a, 
a large majority of what could happen in the future. And we also, with this process, created a travel demand model, um, the, the region's first travel demand model. And really, this is just a, uh, uh, I guess, to put it succinctly, it's, it's a model, a representation of the roads and the volumes, um, traffic volumes in the area, um, in which I will get into explaining that a little bit more in a second here. So starting with the crash analysis, uh, we saw that it's basically about the same or there's a small increase over the past five years. So the total crashes you see in the chart um, in blue, um, property damage only crashes are in the yellow. Um, and then we also documented there the, the fatal and disabling injury and minor injury crashes. So though there is a small, very uh, nominal increase over the past five years, um, you know, to achieve that goal, we may need to, you know, relook at that and see how we can recommend projects to try and make that trend go downwards instead of the increase. Um, the good news is that it, it appears that the fatal crashes are trending downwards. So that, that is good news. So, um, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on as we continue to move forward as a region. So the travel demand model, I know that's a very complicated <laughs> graphic over on the right side of the screen, but really what we're trying to do here is it's a three-step model. You know, we look at trip generation, basically how many cars are in the network. Uh, it's then we look at trip distribution, basically the origins and destinations, where are those cars going? And then traffic assignment, how do those cars get from where they originated to where they are, are destined to. And um, so all of those basically get input into a model. Um, and so it's looking at population inputs, employment inputs, uh, and we make some assumptions regarding growth. Um, and then we also just make sure that our model is validated at the end. We compare it to uh, past, uh, historical traffic volumes to make sure that we're reflecting that the model is acting like it should, you know, with, uh, with historic volumes um, before we then predict out to the future. So um, looking at the future then, we looked at two different scenarios here. Um, and this is this really followed um, the recent comprehensive plan uh, scenarios in that there's a conventional growth scenario in population and employment that really was, you know, kind of going out from the city cores, you know, looking, um, it's, it's a growth pattern that has been occurring uh, in recent history um, where you're expanding out um, from the city core. And then there was another growth scenario that looked at infill development. So basically, instead of expanding the borders of the city or expanding out into the, you know, the suburbs, what if we you know, had a retrofit and redevelopment in the downtown cores, you know, reinvestment in you know, housing and um, employment in those areas? So those were the two scenarios that we looked at. And with that, you can see in the red, that's really where in the, the results of the model really had um, similar, somewhat similar results. Um, and you can see in the red is where that those cars are going to increase. Uh, you can see, on, this is, I'm looking at the left um, graphic on the screen here. And uh, we anticipate a lot of, a lot of growth on I-55. Um, Route K west of I-55 was also something that um, caught our attention as well. Um, and so that really translates to the graphic on the right, which is level of service. And level of service is really uh, a scale that measures people's tolerance for delay and congestion. So typically, uh, rural areas like level service C tends to be ac acceptable and you know in urban areas level service D may be acceptable. So when you start getting into level service E's and F's, luckily we don't see any F's in the network here, um, but when we get into level service E, that's when we're really looking at trying to make capacity improvements, meaning you know for instance I-55 there 
um, you see the red on I-55, uh, MoDOT has identified that there was a need for six lanes um, through that area or additional lanes on I-55. And um, our model uh, definitely confirmed that, um, but that by 2045, you would need some expansion of I-55. So, um, so um, like I just mentioned, the I-55 congestion. Uh, but it was also some findings that we saw was that downtown Cape Girardeau may also have some future congestion issues. And so that needs to keep an eye on that as well. And um, and you know the, the improvements between uh, retrofit and redevelopment, there was um, some nominal improvements there. As you can see, you know, at the bottom, those numbers aren't too far off from each other. Um, and so what that kind of meant, uh, you know, what I saw with that was that the needed improvements are really the same regardless of the scenario, regardless of how you grow, whether it's the retrofit or the conventional growth, um, that, uh, that several of your major improvements in the area really would need to be um, basically about the same. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Kelly. Okay, so from there, um, we started looking at uh, projects. Uh, we worked with our member agencies um, and we, we ended up with a database and it included the project sponsor, what type of project um, it is, the motive of the project, um, a brief description of the project, uh, funding status. So we really wanted to focus on this. Um, fiscally constrained means that we have the money available to do this particular project. Illustrative means that it's unfunded at this time. It's very important for us though to identify these projects so that member agencies and or SIMPO can help look for funding opportunities um, in order to complete these projects then. Uh, we also included a cost esti estimate where we could and um, identified some funding sources as well. Now we had over, well, close to 90 projects. So I'm not going to go through all 90 projects with you all today. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about each mode and sort of some, some interesting things that, that we discovered um, when developing this, this project database. Um, so we'll start with aviation. I was thrilled to see the um, amount of strategy and uh, creativeness that the airport has done. Um, with regard to finding different funding sources and um, making them work together so um, in order to accomplish as many projects as they possibly can. They're in the process, many of you probably know, of updating their um, master plan right now. And um, I, I think it's they're, they're well on their way um, with, with that particular project. They've identified um, some really important and exciting projects, such as you've probably heard of the, the passenger terminal, um, the replacement of the air traffic control tower, some new hangars, some runway um, renovations or reconstructions, things like that. But you can see that it's a significant um, investment and many different funding sources to help them get there. Um, the, the master plan has identified some unfunded projects that you can see there more in the, the pinkish color. Um, and so those, again, now that those have been identified, uh, then the airport or other agencies can try to help uh, look at different funding sources that might be available that fit those needs for that particular project. And as a master plan, um, uh, as they continue to work on that master plan, other projects you know, possibly will be identified there and will need to be added to this list. Uh, the next mode that we'll talk about is bike ped. Um, SIMPO was very fortunate about two years ago, they completed um, a bike ped regional plan. Um, and so it identified many different types of bike ped projects uh, from sidewalks to pedestrian crossings, um, particularly at signalized intersections, but they don't have the push buttons there yet. Um, some trail improvements, um, some bike lanes. Then the member agencies came together and they looked at these different um, projects um, that the plan had, had put together and kind of created their priority uh, list. And so these are a few of those um, priorities that, that the member agencies um, had produced from, from the, the larger list of the bike ped plan. Uh, all of these are unfunded at this time. So again, a really good opportunity now to start looking for the funding um, and see which projects would align with different funding sources. 
roads. You can imagine that uh, the database was was filled with many roads type projects and bridges um, projects. I did not include all of our uh, fiscally constrained projects here. Um, the member agencies are, are very fortunate in that the communities have um, uh, initiatives in place to help fund a lot of their uh, transportation roadway type projects um, as well as MoDOT. And so, so I think they're doing really well. And I didn't include all of the unfunded projects either. What I tried to do here, um, just for the purposes of this meeting, was kind of pull out some of the larger regionally, uh, region, regionally more significant projects um, that, that are maybe of interest as well. And Cheryl discussed um, the I-55, so additionally, um, maybe adding a lane in each direction from Scott City to Fruitland that had been identified at one time. Um, there's the project on Route 25 that goes from Jackson 3472 down to Route K. Um, looks like that could be a significant project as well um, that, that could really provide some benefit. Next uh, is transit. Um, again, this is another agency that, that's been, um, or agencies, I should say, that have been really creative in, in gathering funds, um, primarily from an operational standpoint. Um, we, you know, we think about CTA, but we also have, that's um, Cape Transit Authority, but we also have SEMO um, has some transit functions and some others as well. And so, so they've done a really good job in, in getting some, some funding allocated for their operations. Um, what this list is simply showing is some unfunded needs that the C CTA has identified, um, sort of some, some exciting projects. Um, they'd like to relocate the transit facility, so they're looking for some land um, to, to provide for a new facility. Also some extension of some bus routes um, to the northern and southern areas of the county. Um, and all the way to um, maybe some needs for some bus stop shelters along the current bus routes. So some really good projects that they've identified. Um, now again, we just need to look for the funding uh, sources available for them. And then the port, uh, you can see it's just incredible. The um, the financial um, significance of the improvements that, that they have here. Um, they're investing nearly $35 million uh, within the next few years um, on fiscally constrained projects um, right here in our area at our port. This is incredible. And um, how they strategically went after their funding sources um, and, and kind of pieced several pieces together was, was, is really, really um, impressive, I think. And then, of course, we there's still um, they've identified some other projects still that are unfunded. Um, so again, um, th those are really good to have in the queue so that you know uh, what developments you need to look for funding for. I think that wraps up our um, projects. So I'll turn it over to Alex. Thank you. Okay, so what's next? Um, certainly, we're going to consider any feedback that we get here today. Um, the next step then would be to finalize a draft plan to then present to our SEMPO board. Um, with that draft plan, we would make that available for further public comment starting on February 19th. Um, we'll also have it posted to our website. We'll then schedule a public hearing, which both the SEMPO board and the SEMPO QPC, all those meetings are open to the public. Anyone's welcome to come and um, speak on any item. So the public hearing will be on March 17th. It will then be released for federal review. And then we anticipate sending it to the SEMPO board for final approval in April at the April 21st meeting. And then the real fun begins. And then we get to, to start implementing the plan and enacting this 20-year vision that we've established for our community. And I think that would then take us to our last slide. And we would open it up for any questions that the group has. So I'm not sure if you've given them. Oh, sorry, Katie, go ahead. Um, attendees, there is a box at the bottom of the screen that says Q&A. You're welcome to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Um, any open questions will be answered by our panel um, you can also submit those questions to the emails listed on the page in front of you. Um, at this time, we don't have any questions in the chat box, so we'll 
turn it over to our panelists if they want to um, share a little bit more information. Well, this was a, a certainly a, a very fast tracked uh, process. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been wonderful getting to know your, your area um, as well as we do now. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, we're certainly happy to answer any questions that you have regarding uh, crash history or um, regarding the travel demand model. Um, I know I went through that information pretty quickly. Um, so. We do have a question from John. Uh, he asks, how does this plan differ greatly from the original plan five years ago? And that's, that's one good thing, and I'll certainly let our, our partners answer that as well. Um, one, uh, it's a 20-year vision, but it's federally required that we update it every five years. Um, the, the school of thought there is that so much can change within five years that there's a lot of components to your plan that may have already come to fruition and no longer need to be there. Or maybe the community grew in a different direction and your plan needs just updated and revised. So it is an update from five years ago. Um, two major components that, that this document will have are the inclusion of performance measures as well as our traffic demand model. That was something that when we first did our original MTP, it just wasn't a resource we had available. Um, going through this selection process to get KLG on board as well as Lockmuller, uh, we were fortunate to be able to have those resources available to us now to be able to do that. And Kelly and Cheryl, I'm not sure if there's anything else you had to add. Um, I think um, the the goals, objectives, and um, uh, performance measures are are probably one of the biggest differences. Um, you know, they were really refined as compared to before, and really the travel demand model was the was a big factor here. Um, the one of the benefits of now having this model for your region is that you'll now be able to like your member agencies can request to you know use the model to to try out other various scenarios you know in the next five in the next five years the next you know 20 years um you know you have this model so like hey what what would it look like if we say added outer roads you know along i-55 or you know if we added that new road connection um uh, that Kelly had mentioned um, in the roads uh, section, you know, and you can model that and see what that impact might be um, uh, before you spend the money on, you know, uh, a, a design or, um, you know, kind of guessing as to what it, what, what impact or benefit it might have. Um, so it also provides, you know, a, a baseline with, um, you know, some some of that uh, the data driven process here you know we we come up with you know a vehicle miles traveled for the entire for the area well in five years from now you know if, if when you update the model um you know with the various growth and with the various you know historical traffic volumes you can see if your overall uh vehicle miles traveled has gone down if it has increased or decreased um and um and really, you know, it, it helps inform, you know, the decisions on this plan. So I think I think those are a couple of the areas that it varies different, uh, varies greatly from from before. Yeah, those are really good points. And the only other thing I would add is, um, fortunately, I think uh, partially because of CARES Act and some of the other funding that's become available, um, we can see just within five years the um, amount of um, uh, funding and investment that's that's being made within this region and that that's very exciting as well to see that Great, um, we don't have any additional questions. And, oh John says thank you for the summary. Um, I will add another question um, This was obviously a a, um, a very quick 
evaluation of a long range transportation plan. Um, is there anything that you as consultants discovered during this process um, that was new or interesting that should be information shared with the SEMPO region? Something that is unusual or maybe caught your attention? Yeah, um, I'll start with that one. Um, I'm not so sure if it was unusual, but um, we really appreciated uh, the public feedback that we received. And, um, and the one consistent um, message that we heard, and we have relayed this to SIMPO and, and they've, they've taken to it uh, very well, um, is, is the, the need or the want for, for more um, coordinated efforts. You know, we have a lot of different entities who touch transportation from from one point or another. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to bring all of those groups together. And so if there could be more of a coordinated effort, um, then I, I, that's what, what we continue to hear from, from folks. And so um, I think SIMPO is, is willing to take that on. They, they clearly made that a goal of theirs. Um, and so I thought that was very an interesting piece that we heard. Uh, Cheryl or Alex, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think you summarize it pretty well. I think that was the one of our biggest takeaways from that, you know, was the public feedback aspect of this, you know, and it, I mean, it informs a whole new, you know, a whole new goal for us. Um, so, um, so that was pretty exciting to see. One thing I was very impressed with was during the focus group process, just the amount of stakeholders that you were able to bring in and the discussions that were had. Um, really, it was just a great cross-section of people interested in all facets of transportation. You know, bicyclists, you had people just concerned about their commute, you had people that you know, had freight knowledge, aviation knowledge, knowledge about the ports. So I thought a, a great cross-section of all the modes of transportation in our area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, another question that, though not in the chat box, I think people may be asking, what, what had to change during this process uh, because of COVID? Was there any changes you had to make into the, uh, how you approached community engagement or how you were able to gather information? Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked that because I was thinking about that during your last question. Um, it, it was interesting and, and I, we are thrilled that we had so many um, people reach out to us and respond and participate, particularly during a pandemic. Um, everything has had to be virtual um, to date and, and it is difficult, but you know, I think uh, if we put a positive spin on it, you know, it, it's kind of been helpful too. For instance, these two meetings that we're having um, today at noon and then one again this evening, this allows for people to have a little bit more flexibility to join the meeting. Um, they can listen to the meeting after hours, you know, because we're going to record it and make it available to them. Um, here we are in, in an ice storm or some, you know, inclement weather today. And so if we had this um, in person, I don't know if we would have gotten very many people to attend because of the weather. So um, to put a positive spin on it, you know, maybe, maybe it's uh, helpful to have some of these things uh, virtual. Cheryl, Alex, anything to add? I was just going to say, yeah, you're looking at it right now. <laughs> this, is, this has been our, our, our best way of moving this project forward. It certainly presented challenges, just as Kelly had said, but there were some silver linings. Um, doing things virtually does have some cross benefits to it. It gives more flexibility to folks that, you know, that they're working all day, they have to get home, they have to feed their kids. Life is challenging at times, so we understand that it's not always easy to physically show up to a public meeting. So we're, we're happy to be able to provide this forum too. Thank you guys for your responses. Again, if you're in the audience and you would like to ask a question about the project or the plans included, uh, there appears to be a question from John. It says, uh, with significant boom in cycle sales during 2020, are other communities preparing for additional cyclists on the road? Is SEMPO adjusting our planning for an increase in cyclists throughout the region? 
Um, I'll, I'll start with that one and then I may throw it over to Cheryl, but um, as I said, we had just two years ago developed, um, Simpo had developed a, a regional bike ped plan and the, the outreach during that process was incredible. Um, we, we have a very active um, uh, communities here in this region and um, they really provided a lot of input um, towards the bike ped um, pro type projects. And so um, I think it's a great list. The member agencies, again, have kind of come together and prioritized some of those projects. Um, and so now it's just a matter of, of looking, looking for the right funding opportunity to fund those particular projects. Yeah, I, I would say from the, the national scale, there is definitely uh, communities that really fast tracked uh, plans that may have taken another year or two to implement. Um, you know, you know, not not just, uh, I mean, there's a lot of communities that say, you know, shut down streets and created more festival streets. And, you know, since they're, so, since the uh, vehicle volumes were so low, you know, and people didn't really feel comfortable being inside, you know, they shut down whole streets and brought tables outside, you know, to help those restaurants stay open during, um, during the pandemic, uh, for instance. Um, but also, you know, the, the, it really did focus a lot of attention on uh, bicycles and bicycling facilities within regions. And so, um, so really what we saw, you know, is that it fast tracked um, a lot of uh, infrastructure improvements. Um, so. Alex, do you have any more you'd like to add to that one? I would, I would just echo uh, what Cheryl had said. And I can't remember if it was at a, AMPO conference or not, but I had noticed some communities because of the reduction in traffic in their, specifically in their downtown areas would shut down portions of the streets to accommodate for outdoor eating just because the transportation demand wasn't there. A lot more people were commuting by foot or bicycle and uh, I thought it was just a great way to respond to the, you know, changing dynamics. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think the pandemic is also going to be very interesting in the next several years as it adjusts, you know, the, the funding available for some of these uh, projects, you know, so that was, uh, you know, something that happened in such a short and fast, you know, amount of time, but yet, you know, it, so it really disrupts some of this long-term thinking sometimes, you know, like, um, so that was, that's definitely a challenge. Great, um, that is a great, an uh, great answers, guys. And one thing I'll add is, just from a planning perspective, the the pandemic has sped up a lot of changes that we were seeing slowly evolving. Um, so you, this next question comes from Dan. Uh, similarly, talks about new transportation technologies. So he asked, does this plan take into consideration changes? in technology in the upcoming years? For instance, remote work and shrinking rural populations, will that change how people use the street? Uh, great questions. Yes, um, we, we the plan does consider those things um, as well as all of the new um, transportation technologies that are becoming available, driverless vehicles and um, there's there's a lot moving and uh, it's changing very quickly, Katie, as you had said. Um, so those are excellent questions. Um, Cheryl, do you want to add any more to that? I think um, it's really identifying some of the what those technological advances are, and you know, making sure that the region is aware of them. You know, and and you know, then Sempo's job, I think, is really to you know to support some of those policies at you know, more, the more local level, um, you know, for, you know, identifying where some of those uh, improvements can be, you know, and if a project um, should move forward, you know, say, you know, with the, say the city of Cape Girardeau, you know, wants to move forward with that, um, you know, certainly identifying some of that. So, um, so the plan that will identify some of those future, um, future trends and technologies. Um, 
the the remote home the remote work is an interesting one you know because i think we're still seeing how that plays out you know and it, we'll continue to see how that plays out over the next uh, you know year or what or whatnot um you know because is this stay you know work from home how permanent is it you know it, when people do start going back to work eventually um you know is it going to be five days a week is it going to be one day a week is it a mix you know so um so we can definitely see this really um we'll definitely need to be paying attention over the next five years and 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 stuff and i'll i'll, I'll be curious five years from now how that affects the next mtp uh go around mm -hmm. for sure this is katie i'm just going to follow up with that question um to our panelists, you're all experts in transportation. What do you see as the most um, emerging technology that may impact the Sampo region in the next 10 years? I think in the next 10 years, I, I really see the, you know, the, the signal technology, you know, and intelligent transportation systems, you know, and, and, you know, I, I know, um, uh, MoDOT has that system along Kings Highway, um, you know, but, but really getting your system to talk to each other um, a lot more, you know, so it can be uh, managed better. Um, and um, I, I think that is more of a near term because I think 10 years, you know, in, in, in our world is definitely somewhat near term, um, you know, once you get funded and everything for it. So because I think, you know, when you start talking, say, autonomous vehicles um, and that type of technology, you know, there's a lot of people working and some really brilliant people, you know, working on those um, those problems. Um, but I, th I think those have a, a, a ways to go yet before they can be implemented at um, a, a city level, uh, for instance, so. And I'll, I'll add to that just slightly. And John, I just saw your comment. Thank you, that's very kind, John McGowan. Um, it, that and the previous question uh, reminded me of that famous quote that if you're if you're planning for what you have, you're already behind the curve. And I, I think that there are quite a number of you know, new things coming about that are really going to change uh, not only this area, but nationwide. Um, just as Cheryl had said, autonomous vehicles, the importance of a uh, fiber optic network that can su support these smart signals and a uh, different type of technology infrastructure for all these smart vehicles, um, things like alternative fuel corridors. Uh, we have a new administration now that I think is going to be pushing uh, electric vehicles quite a bit. So, and, and drones even. Yeah, Amazon's looking at somehow delivering packages via drone. Um, yeah, that brings a lot of challenges too, uh, certainly with FAA regulations on drones and you know, we have air, an airport here. We don't want that messing with our flight. So there's quite a bit to think about over the next 10 years, certainly. Yeah, I would just add freight is changing significantly, you know, with, with the Amazon world and stuff as well. And so um, keeping ahead of, of that trend is important um, also. Mm -hmm. A lot of moving parts. We've got about 10 minutes left, um, still open for questions. Anybody wants to submit? I have a question for the panel. Um, Cape Girardeau, Sempo is a, a unique region that spans multiple states. How do you, uh, how does this process engage both Illinois and Missouri? Good question. Um, we are a bi-state, uh, Sempo is a bi-state MPO. And so um, part of the member agencies include both the state of um, Missouri and the state of Illinois, and also um, federal representation um, from, from both, both areas. And so um, they've, they've been included in, in this particular process from a steering committee uh, perspective. 
And I don't know, anything else to add to that, Cheryl or Alex? Uh, we have IDOT representation at our board meetings and at our technical planning meetings. Um, also, FTA from from the Illinois side as well. Mm -hmm. So the, they're certainly a planning partner of ours in our meetings, planning processes. Well, and then from the analysis side as well, you know, for instance, when we look at crash data, we look at from both states, you know, looking at the entire uh, MPA, Metropolitan Planning Area. You know, so um, so whenever we're looking at the data and the analysis aspect of this process, um, it was not just MoDOT, you know, we were looking at, you know, or, or Missouri, we were looking at both states. Um, and I think that goes towards our um, uh, performance measures as, as well, you know, and, and um, our resolution. Um, I don't know if one of you want to speak to the resolutions that were Past. Sure. sure. The O board supported both um, the Illinois Department of Transportation's performance measures that they had established for their state, as well as the Missouri Department of Transportation performance measures. Um, those are available on Simbo's website, and we can provide those for anyone interested in them. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 not just one state. It 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 uh, doubles the. <laughs> Total the uh, amount of work, I guess. <laughs> so, um, another thing that was discovered during the plan, the Sempo region really is a regional transportation hub, a multimodal transportation hub. Um, what is, diff uh, as far as having the assets of a port, an airport, public transit, how do these um, impact the Sempo region in the future? Uh, say that again, Katie, how do all these different modes impact the region? How, I guess, yes. How do, um, how does this region differentiate from other areas of the state of Missouri or Illinois um, with their, their concentration of air and port and transit assets? Um, and why is it important to coordinate those efforts? Sure. I, I think that's the benefit of having the MPO um, is, is to bring all the different transportation entities together, all the different modes. And so um, uh, within SIMPO, part of the, uh, the technical planning group and as well as the, the board, the, the policymakers, um, that includes all of the different the modes of transportation. So they all kind of have a seat at the table. And, and again, that is the benefit of, of the MPO is to bring all those modes together because so many times um, as a transportation specialist, you know, you kind of just focus on the one that you're used to, whether that's roadways or airport and, and it's hard to, you know, think about the, all the modes together and that's, that's certainly the benefit of, of the MPO. Um, yeah, Cheryl or Alex, anything more to add to that? One thing to highlight about our community, because we, we are a relatively smaller MPO. Uh, when the census was done in 2010, we were just north of that fresh threshold of 50,000. But really for an MPO our size to have the amount of different modes of transportation within our, our area, with our port, with our airport, with our highway system, it, not every MPO of our size has all these amenities that I'll be able to offer. So it's, it's really a, a feather in the cap of, of our area that we have all these. Thank you. All right, well, um, unless there are additional questions that anybody wants to ask in the Q&A box, we may be wrapping up a little early. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And again, um, if you have any follow-up questions or want any more information, uh, you can see Alex, Alex's information there, contact information and mine as well. And, and again, we'll post um, this recording to our um, uh, website and probably Facebook site as well. So thank you all. Can you remind them as to when the plan might be available? Yes. Marla, can you go back once? What was the date on that? February 19th 
uh, it will be available um, for public comment. And again, that will be at the southeastmpo.org website. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good, good afternoon. Stay safe. Thank you.